with some civility. Um, I took my first trip to Italy when I was 16 years old. I went back with my parents who were returning for the first time since they had left to come to America. Something that I never, ever forgave them for. <laughs> Thank you. And the very first thing I saw upon my arrival was this billboard. And I was immediately smitten. I, I, I had no idea what this was advertising, because I didn't see the, the bottom line. But um, I'd never seen anything like this before. And this was a three-way epiphany for me. I, I fell in love immediately with food, type, and Italy. And so I, I started going to Italy as often as possible, obsessively collecting ephemera from uh, flea markets, produce markets, bookstores, um, whatever. Anything with Italian typography on it was, was magical to me. And especially the signage. And the great thing about the signage was that um, when the dollar started to weaken and the flea markets started drying up, I always had signs that I could photograph 24-7, which was great. And this is one of my favorite towns um, for for signage. This was in Viareggio, and uh, I took these photographs in 1983, and they're still among my favorite signs. Um, in this town, there are all these different beach clubs in each, at that line the, the, um, the main street along the beach, and each one has its own distinctive um, oops, uh, 30s looking logo type. Um, so, so, in the meantime, I was art director of Pantheon Books for 11 years, and then I started my own studio in 1989, where I, I made a concerted effort to, to integrate my interest in all things Italian into my work. So, in order to do that, I started doing my own projects, like this book, which was the first in a series of um, books on art deco graphic design that I did with my husband, Stephen Heller, um, for Chronicle Books. And, and then after that, uh, the, the little book room, which was one of my clients, asked me to do this little book. Uh, it's a little guidebook to artisan shops in Florence. And even though when she asked me to do it, I said, well, I'm, I am neither a shopper nor am I a writer, and that didn't seem to be a problem, so <laughs> why not? And then this one, uh, Italianissimo, which um, the only way I can describe this to you is that it's all the things that we love and sometimes love to hate about Italy, mostly love. And then uh, Princeton Architectural Press, who published, uh, who published this this book that I'm going to be speaking about tonight, and others of mine, asked me to uh, to design something for this new gift line that they were starting. So I'd always been collecting Italian pencil boxes, and uh, I especially liked the, the double-sided pencils that had uh, red and blue leads for teachers to correct homework. But since red and black are my signature colors, I decided to go with that instead. And then this book, which was a monograph of my work, and um, when I uh, was spending a about a hundred years putting this book together, or what felt like it, um, I made a, a vow to myself that when the book was finished, I would take uh, a month off. Not, of course, to take a vacation, but to, to do something I'd always wanted to do. I uh, always wanted to go to the American Academy in Rome. And this was an opportunity to go there for a month so that I could um, that I could just photograph all of the signs in Rome, or at least most of them. And I can tell you something. It's a really good thing every 30 years to take off a month. Because this was the first time. The, the only other time I had done this was in 1983 when I had taken those pictures of the signs in Via Reggio. So it's, I seem to be on to something. So in, in the meantime, these signs that I had been photographing for all these years had been a constant source of inspiration to me, but I had never considered doing anything with them. They were really just for my own enjoyment and reference, especially because I had started out by photographing these signs in as 35 millimeter slides, which are what those were that I just showed you. And then they evolved into point and shoot snapshots and then uh, finally digital. So, uh, and in the meantime I had been 
traveling to Rome on a regular basis because I teach a, a master's workshop there every summer. And I was taking pictures of a lot of the signs and noticing that every time I went back, more and more of them were disappearing. And I really felt this sense of urgency to go back there and, and reshoot as much as possible now that the technology was better, which was sort of ironic because now that, that the technology uh, was more sophisticated and I could take um, I could take photographs that actually could be put into a book, which is something I could never have considered before, uh, that was sort of the same reason that the, the signs were disappearing because they were all being replaced with clumsily crafted computer generated signs and really bad free fonts. So I started out with this very modest uh, Google map that I put together of all the signs that I wanted to re-photograph that I had already pre previously photographed and then sort of went on from there. And I was also um, a photographer friend of mine recommended uh, that I get this lightweight tripod called a Gitzo. All the equipment that I ended up using had very cute names. Uh, so I would go out every morning. I set my alarm and go out um, as soon as the sun was up and just started photographing. Uh, Rome, of course, is the uh, is the birthplace of the the modern letter. So so there certainly are uh, a number of of good classical looking signs there, and some some gold leaf left over, but. What you find the most of, I think, in Rome are, are the more eclectic signs. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the extra wide storefronts allow for uh, this dramatic sprawling of a, of a name. And um, this happens to be uh, one of my favorite signs of one of my favorite gelaterias in, in Rome, so I spend a lot of time there. Uh, and I love how this one just goes across two different buildings that are two different colors, but no matter, you know, it's, it's the, the type that is important. And this, I think, is the sexiest sign in Rome by far. It's, um, it's uh, on a corner, so you, have, you get to see it twice. And um, I, was, I, I spent a lot of time trying to talk to the shopkeepers when I was taking these signs to see how much I could learn about the history of them. And um, I always seem to find the same situation, both with Joliti that you just saw and Franchi. Uh, it was a third generation business, and I would be talking to the, the grandson of the original owner, and usually they were in their 80s, and they were <coughs> always they were always there in the, st in the shop. I, I never went and asked for the proprietor and didn't find them there. They were always there working. And so when I asked Signor Franchi if he could tell me when this, this sign was made, he said, well, for the vertical sign, that was done in 1947, but for the script sign, I had to wait longer because the uh, people who lived in the apartment on the second floor were not interested in having this sign, no matter how beautiful it was, blocking their view. <coughs> so I said, so what did you do? And he said, and he just shrugged his shoulders, and he said, so I bought the apartment. <laughs> so... <laughs> And this one is right around the corner, Castroni. And I was I was there uh, in Rome uh, over the Christmas holidays and tried to avoid the Christmas decorations um, in most circumstances. But in this case, I loved how they had meticulously stuffed that evergreen into every negative space in the sign. I thought that was very well done. And Ruggeri is. Um, is a salsa menteria that's in the uh, Campo dei Fiori. It's quite well known, and it's been there since the early 1900s. But if you go inside, you'll see that the original facade looked like this. They didn't need a sign because all those hanging prosciutti kind of told the story quite well. And um, I think you could only see a sign like this in Rome. Like this, when when else would you see a sign for a hat store that was this big? <laughs> And this comical looking, um, you'll never forget it. And I, I certainly didn't because um, I actually happened to see it because I was on my way to interview the last living gold leaf sign maker in Rome. And I had gotten there a little bit early. So I walked around the neighborhood and found this sign and photographed it. And then 10 minutes later, I was talking to the sign maker and then he was showing me some of his reference. And he showed me this alphabet that he was working on, which looks remarkably like the one <laughs> that I had just seen in the sign, but I didn't want to say anything. Um, 
And this type style is also typically um, found in, in places in Rome. This, this is uh, the butcher who wanted to, to pose as part of the picture. Um, and both Tatsudoro and um, San Eustachio are, in, are neck and neck for the best coffee in Rome. They're both near the Pantheon, which is in the background here. But by far, Tatsudoro is, is the winner for the funkiest letter forms <laughs> for any cafe in Rome. And they, they have it on the three different facades um, of, of this uh, cafe. Rome is not afraid of color, nor are they afraid of uh, electrical wiring all over the, the sign. Uh, this is for a florist. And this, this sign, I think, is just hilarious. This is, uh, can anybody read the, the, the word in blue? Bravo, but you know Italian. I think the average, <laughs> the average um, non-speaker of Italian would never be able to read that. It looks like Laga, Laga Lingi or something. So this is a hardware store that sells Zerbini di Coco, Coco mats or, door, or floor mats. And um, it's, it's just unforgettable. So sometimes style trumps readability. Yes, isn't that beautiful? But it, you know, I think it takes a little extra longer to read it with all of these overlapping letters, but I think it's really worth the extra effort to, uh, to decode it. And this is Rome's version of a plan ahead sign. You know, it looks like they, somebody really tried to get the sign to line up with the doorway, but didn't quite make it. <laughs> but, um, this, I think, is the most beautiful sign in Rome, uh, and you can probably tell by the, the type of photo it is that it's no longer there. It, it was an art supply store, and this is dimensional letter, lettering, I think, is so beautiful. Does anybody know what this is? It's, it's a parking garage. It's rather elegant, wouldn't you say, for a parking garage. Um, and this one, uh, this sign had intrigued me, and I couldn't get a good photograph of it because this damn umbrella was in the way every time I went there. So, um, so, so I finally decided to go back there on Christmas Day because I thought on Christmas they've got to be closed and the umbrella won't be there. So I um, enlisted my entire family. My, my husband Steve and my son Nick came, with, came out with me on Christmas morning. It was a nice little family foray, and we went to go try to photograph this, and the, the umbrella was still up. And so we were trying with the tripod, and it was the same problem again. And then Steve had this great idea. He said, why don't you hold up the tripod, which is what we did. So this is a picture of Nick holding up the tripod, and I'm saying, don't you dare drop this thing. And I, and I was, um, I clicked the, um, the, shutter, the shutter release the cable release. And Steve took the picture with his phone, so it was a real family effort. I like that. But even more important than that is that um, this, this changed everything, because when I came back to New York and was telling my staff about what had happened, Spencer Charles, who is here tonight, who was my senior designer, said, well, why don't you get a telescoping pole? And before I could even ask, what is a telescoping pole, he found one on the internet for me. So the next time I went back, when I was in Bologna, I had my tadpole, my secret weapon, another cute name, that gave me something that I had always wanted in life, three extra feet of height. <laughs> so, so this was great. I, I, it was much easier to, to carry around, and it was a lot less obtrusive. And you can see in this picture, not, not everybody was staring at me for a change. So. Um, and it enabled me to be more straight on to the, to the signs, which was great. But let's go back to Rome. So this is a sign, uh, a very iconic sign, actually, in Trastevere that you see everywhere. This is on t-shirts and calendars and, and postcards. It's, it's just become this iconic uh, sign for some reason. I've even seen it on uh, iPhone cases. And this is a sign which isn't in the book, but I think it's very touching. Uh, this is on Via Marguta, which is a very nice little street near the Piazza del Popolo. And uh, I went, I, well, actually, this is the street that 
uh, Gregory Peck's character lived on in the film Roman Holiday. But it, it's also the street where Giulietta Massina and Federico Fellini used to live. And I went to go look, uh, I, I found what's somewhere, the, the building number, so I went to go look for their, their uh, building, and I found that there was this little plaque there with these two caricatures that were done by Fellini, and, uh, and the, the, um, the writing here waxes poetic about what a beautiful street Via Marguta is, and it's uh, equal to none. So going from the lyrical to the fascistic, we, we, we now end up in the Foro Italico, which was built by Mussolini for the Olympics in the late 20s. And it is still a sports stadium, and all of the walkways are surrounded, uh, sur that surround the area are all done in these uh, mosaic uh, typographic displays. This is, just gives you an idea of the scale, which is quite something. And um, yeah, they're really pretty amazing. And not far from there, you can find examples of uh, futurist typography as well. This is at the, the zoo in the um, uh, Borghese Gardens. And it's just this one sign that is treated in this futurist style. And you can almost forgive them for having that backwards U in the museo, right? And the way they badly painted it. but. Um, and then not far from there is this train station. Uh, and I always thought this was sort of a goof, you know, like why would they have this kind of lettering? But it, this really was uh, done in the 20s. Uh, and I, I had photographed it many times, but it wasn't until I went inside that I found out that they had this on the pavement, which was pretty amazing. But the first time I went to go photograph it, I... Um, was using my tadpole, and the lighting in there was very bad, and it wasn't coming out very well. Um, but before I even had a chance to uh, do anything more about it, I got thrown out by a very polite station mistress. Apparently, there's a law in Italy that you're not allowed to photograph in train stations, which was news to me, because in the Florence train station, you see people photographing the signage there all the time. So I guess I didn't get the memo. but. Um, I decided to go back the next day with my tripod. So I, I assembled everything in my hotel room. I set up my tripod and I got a very loose raincoat to hide the <laughs> tripod under. And, and I took a very crisp 20 euro bill and put it in my front pocket. I have never tried to, to uh, bribe an Italian official before, but I had to, I had to get this picture. So I would do anything. So I got there, and I was very lucky. It was a, a, it was a strike that day, so the, the trains were running, but less frequently. So I, I bought a ticket, I went through the turnstile, and, you know, and there it was right on the pavement on the other side of the turnstile. And um, it was very quiet, and I, I took all my shots you know, in sections, and nobody came and threw me out, and I, I couldn't believe my good luck. And then all of a sudden, a train pulled in, and before I knew it, before I could pack myself up, uh, there was this very large and very angry-looking Italian official in a uniform standing over me, and I took the 20-euro bill, and I ran to the nearest gelateria and put it to better use. <laughs> so, uh, this is in a, a, an area on the outskirts of Rome called Garbatella, which was a... Um, uh, a housing project that was started in the 20s and, and then the fascists mm -hmm. took it over. And they have these beautiful plaques all over uh, on every building, uh, every lot number is, is indicated like this. But you'll notice that something's missing from these signs. Whoops. Uh, all of the fascist, uh, the fascist, the fascist mm -hmm. symbol is missing here on the left. That was, each one was removed with great patriotic vigor. Um, and this is a sign that I actually found on Google Street View. Like whenever it was raining and I couldn't go out or if it was uh, in the evening, I would go on Google Street View and I would just try to pick a neighborhood that I had never explored yet and just kind of drive around and you never know what you're going to find. So I found a sign that was near the train station and I went to go photograph it. And I went to go talk to the owner who, same thing, third generation, he said that this sign had been there since 1939 when the shop first opened, and he actually emailed me this photo, which is pretty great. 
And, and when I asked him about the, um, the style of the typography, he said, oh, uh, um, we stole the, the M and the N from Mussolini. Because <laughs> that was the typical um, fascist style, of, or one of the st fascist styles of typography. So we're going to move on to Florence now. The, the way I'm showing the, the images tonight is different from the way they're arranged in the book. In the book, I arrange them according to style, whereas here I'm, I'm doing it more as a travelogue because it's kind of the way I, I did um, work on the book. So this is a, a pharmacy in Florence that has been closed since the end of World War I. But thank heavens they kept the facade because the, the typography is really fantastic. And each panel has, uh, you know, all these different, different types of uh, type styles. This is a sign for a butcher shop, which you wouldn't, I've never seen any, anything else like this elsewhere, but you see a lot of it in Florence. It's quite beautiful. I like the way they got the building number into the design. Uh, this is the same sort of style. It's no longer a butcher shop, though. It's a library. Uh, it's a, sorry, it's a libreria. It's a books shop, which is kind of a nice change because in Florence, every time I go there, another bookshop is closed. So it's nice to see that that it's uh, it's changed here. And and certainly Florence has its share of beautiful scripts. I love the way this is is punched out of uh, brass. And some nice gold leaf, and even some elegantly done neon every now and then. Uh, and this, I, I wanted you to see an example. M most of the, the photographs of the book were reshot for the book, but of course not. I've been, ma I've been shooting these for over 35 years, so a lot of them aren't really around anymore. I'd, I'd say about 15% of the, the photographs in the book weren't redone just for the book. Uh, so this is one example. This, this shows you how good my staff is at Photoshop, because this is what we started with. <laughs> that was Kelly Thorne, who did a great job. And so this is the Florence train station. As I said, uh, you're free to take photographs there. Uh, and this station was built in 1932 in a very modernist style, and the typography is really quite remarkable, and it's, it's everywhere. Even, even the arrivals board is still up there with this great typography at the top, and the rest of the board is blank because, of course, the, the, the LED sign is around the corner, but at least they, they kept it there. Um, so you can see nice typography everywhere in the station, but what always surprised me was that the outside of the station has a absolutely no signage, except that when I was returning from one of my quick trips there to go back to Rome one evening, I saw this projection on the front of the station, which was pretty horrifying, so, um, but then it went away. Um, so now we're moving on to Bologna, and these, this is a spread from the book, but these are uh, three signs that that uh, live together in my heart, at least, because they're in. They were in the same location, which is here. And this is this picture was taken several years ago when the Capelleria sign was actually for a hat store, and now it's a stonefly store instead. But I always made a point of staying in this hotel. That round sign, the round green sign that you see in the middle, is um, is the Hotel Orologio, where I always used to stay, so I could see these three signs at once. The, the other one is in the right-hand corner, and the third one is, <coughs> not, is gone, unfortunately. And you can see very nice sign, uh, examples of hand-painted uh, signs with dimensional aspects to them. And this is a very nice gold leaf sign that um, is hidden in a, in a very dark galleria. It was for a day hotel, which um, is, is no longer. And th this was a hotel where you could go to take a nap and a shower or whatever. Um, <laughs> and then go back to the train station to take your train home. Um, but uh, it is now a bank. The sign remains. But if you, uh, if you go into the bank and you ask politely and you're willing to wait for the <coughs> the person to come back from having a coffee and you're willing to leave your documenti, 
they will take you downstairs where they still have the, the banyi and they're in mint condition and they've just been left untouched for decades, which I thought was pretty interesting. And there's always some nice wrought iron. Uh, this sign is something I had photographed uh, years ago and I couldn't find it. I looked all over Google Street View and I couldn't figure it out. So then what I decided to do, because it was this was one of my little handmade maps that Kelly had put together for me for every trip. We, we did them by neighborhood and I would figure out the route beforehand. Um, so finally what I did is I went back and I found the original negatives that I had kept from from like about 15 years ago. So I found these two signs and then I saw that that sorbeteria was near there. Um, I didn't go back to re-photograph that sign because uh, that, this is a sign, but that helped me find it on Google Street View. But in the meantime, I wanted to show you that they copied it from this. <laughs> it was actually, it, it, I always thought this was old, but it was actually uh, a newer sign that uh, they just found in that red stone book that everybody has. Um, so now we're moving on to Venice. Who has ever been to Venice before and never gotten lost? <laughs> right. Okay, that's why they have signs like this that have arrows that point to, to restaurants and hotels that no longer exist. <laughs> So and I was so I went back. I made a special trip back to Venice just to rephotograph um, a, a number of signs, and I was I was very surprised to find this one, which is one that I hadn't found before. But I had all of the other ones. These are all on the pavement, and I was I was really excited to find this one because it fit the double page proportion of my book perfectly. <laughs> it was really great. Um, so here are some other ones that are. This one, actually, this pasticceria is still there. So, and so when I arrived uh, in Venice, I went straight from the plane, dropped off everything in my hotel, and then went out with my tadpole that was more truncated to do all these pavement signs. And I noticed right away that I was getting a really weird reaction from the Venetians. They were, um, they would all kind of like hold up their arms in mock horror, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I realized that it looked like I had a rifle in my hand. You know, you know, <laughs> Americans, right? You know, so, um, and this one I had to go back the next day because it was filthy. So I had to go into a supermarket and buy rubber gloves and baby wipes. So, <laughs> whatever it takes, right? So here are some other ones. And this is actually a neon sign, which is supposedly not allowed in... Uh, in Venice, but uh, but I actually liked it better without the neon. But of course, they've got an arrow, and there are a few examples of very nice uh, hand painted scripts. And the street signs, uh, for any of you who have gotten lost in Venice, probably know the street signs are very distinctive, and they even have their own name. These are called nizioletti, which is a Venetian dialect for little sheets, which refers to the uh, the the rectangle that's whitewashed onto the, the building first before this is stenciled on. And they're, they're amazingly well uh, maintained for the most part. And the numerals also have to follow this, this formula, although every now and then you'll find a digression. <laughs> <laughs> and then a short ferry ride from there in the island of Burano, which is known for its its beautifully colored buildings. Every, you know, every building is a different bright color, and that's because the, all the fishermen live there, and they supposedly and they, they want to be able to identify their their house from from when they're at sea. So they have a more um, a more crude rendition of the um, of the typography in in the Nizioletti, which, by the way, was a, a form of Dido that was uh, from that came from the, um, the brief Napoleonic occupation. Um, but these are the building numbers in Burana, which really, really mystified me. I couldn't figure out what they were at first. I didn't even know that they were numbers. But, but finally, by checking the sequence, I finally found a, I had JJJ, and then I had JJ2 and JJ3. So I finally figured out that J is a 1. Right? <laughs> Got that? Okay, let's move on to Luca then. Um, so Luca doesn't seem to have a law about keeping signs intact, but they 
take it very seriously. You find a lot of signs there that that have nothing to do with the shop that's that's uh, inside, but they they really seem to have a respect for um, for their signage heritage. So, um, like this one, this is uh, this is not what it used to be. This is in Liberty Liberty style, the Italian Art Nouveau, as is this one. This still is a bakery. And this still is a jewelry store. But this is my favorite sign in Luca. It's always the first, uh, my first destination as soon as I get there. And they recently restored it. It looks much, much better than the first time I saw it. And this obviously is no longer a pasticceria, biscotteria. It's a running shoe store. <laughs> and I, uh, a friend of mine from Florence met me there, so she had to hold back that um, orange tree that was on the right so you could read the type behind it. Um, and also in Luca, you tend to see signs like this, which I never see in any other town. They're, they're, um, it's silver leaf on black glass, which is very beautiful. And this, you can probably tell, is a really old picture. Um, but I, I love this. It's um, it, this in the ghost sign uh, chapter of my book. And uh, it's now a bank. It's no longer a, a cinema. But it always reminds me of the, the movie Cinema Paradiso. But I love how they always used to have this year-round uh, string of, of Christmas lights up. Um, so then from there, I took a little side trip to Viareggio, uh, where you saw those signs earlier. Um, and I re-photographed these buildings, which are really quite beautiful. They're all in, in Liberty style, and they're all these beautiful gelato shades of color, which are quite wonderful. But um, these signs in Viareggio are not quite as nice as they used to be. That's why in the book I had to use the older um, images. Oh, it says low battery, Matteo. Is this a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, You're back to sleep. Is. Okay. Well, we're all we're almost there. Thank you. Is that it? So I went back to Viareggio, and uh, to my dismay, a lot of those signs either had been painted new garish colors, or they had completely been redesigned. Like here's here's an example. Oh, I, and they probably thought they were getting it right. You know. <laughs> So now we go down to Sicily, where you find lots of nice wrought iron. And I love these beaded curtains. <laughs> They're really great. And, uh, and always nice uh, tile signs as well. And then moving all the way north to Torino, which is, is a really great um, resource for signage. These signs, these are four different signs that are, are on spread in the book, and um, they look like they should be small, but they're actually really big. So I took this picture, not only to show you the scale, but also to show you what was going on above my head when I photographed this. They were, they were fixing one of the three signs for this fancy jewelry store. This one on the top in this spread is, is from that same shop. These were gilded uh, <coughs> wooden letters that were cut out. So these, this is a spread from the book. These are all signs from Torino. That are, two of them are in gold leaf, and the other two are in brass. And, uh, and Torino, like Luca, seems to have this unwritten law to keep the signs. So this, is, this was for a cooperative um, that is now a uh, health food store, health food restaurant. And uh, this sign is, is staggeringly beautiful. When I saw it for the first time, I just gasped, because I had seen pictures of it, but I, I, never, I never realized the scale of it. I mean, it's, it's enormous. It's like a billboard. And, and I found out later that um, this actually, the original name of this was Dux, D-U-X, like Duce. <laughs> and then they changed it after the war. Uh -huh. This is a beautiful uh, farmacia a hunting and fishing store, a beautiful pasticceria with both futurist and uh, fascist type. Oh, and now we're at the end. So, um, so all these images and more are found in this book, which you could buy here tonight, except they've sold out. And, 
And um, my next project, because I, I still feel that sense of urgency that I've got to photograph all these things before it's too late. So I'm just about finished uh, with the next book, which is Graphique de la Rue. It's uh, the signage of Paris. So I have spent the last year uh, sp spending a lot of time in Paris uh, looking up and looking down. Thank you very much. Oh. And hopefully answers. <laughs> hopefully. I can't see. So, yes. So, Louise, I've been familiar with your work for years and, and love that you um, are an Italian flag. Um, but I'm always, I was always curious about the beginning of your career when you got a job with um, Lubalin. Mm -hmm. Like, this love of typography you know, came early, but where did you get from the young 16-year-old love of typography to working for the bomb? I guess. Oh, well. Can you quickly repeat the question? <sighs> How did I get from 16 years old to Herb Lubalin, pretty much, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, the same summer that I went to Italy and my eye, when I was 16, and it totally opened my eyes to that, I sent away for an osmoroid pen and taught myself calligraphy. They used to advertise it in the back of the New Yorker magazine every every week, and I think it was like three ninety five. And I sent away for it. I taught myself calligraphy. I started doing illuminated manuscripts of Bob Dylan lyrics, sell them. <laughs> and I found that I could sell them to classmates. So you know, I had a marketable skill. So from there, I still didn't know what graphic design was because they didn't even call it that in those days. They yes. called it commercial art, which is about as unsexy as you can get. And uh, so I eventually found out, I was always interested in art, but I really didn't want to be a painting major or anything like that. And then when I found out what graphic design was, it all made sense because it was like, oh, so that's why I love calligraphy and making books and taking pictures of signs and collecting orange wrappers. So it all sort of came together, and, and then I started working for Herb Lebel. That's... There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes? I just want to say you and I do it for me too. So <laughs> thank you. Yes. It, have you have you uh, figured out is there anything specific about Italy and the sign making visions there that have led to so many great signs? I think it's just the the creativity. I mean they just uh, you know I, I because I it was interesting because photographing the signage in France which and Paris specifically, which is also wonderful, but it's completely different. And for example, the eclectic chapter in the Italian book uh, is the biggest chapter, and it probably could have been its own book. <laughs> Whereas in in Paris, I had a really hard time finding enough to fill a chapter, you know, because they're just much more mannered, and you know, and they they just do things a certain way, but. The, um, you know, I just found, uh, what I thought was interesting in, in Italy, too, is that every town seems to have its own style. And, and they just, you know, and they were sort of on their own. They just, I guess they just had to copy each other. And maybe one would go to another, one sign would go to another town and learn a few new tricks. But I, I think they were just so open to anything. They would just create their own letter forms. They had no manuals to work from. So um, it just worked out. Matteo? Do you think uh, it's really, really good design or it's just good because we're not used to it and because there's some nostalgia? Because, I mean, some of these signs are really horrible. <laughs> I mean, like, don't really buy somebody who has no idea what lettering or well, is. Well, but we love it. We love it. Well, 
I have two answers to that question. First of all, a lot of people always ask me, would you ever do a book on American signage? Absolutely not. I have no interest in it. You know, because the signs, the signage always looks better to me when it's in Italian or in French, right? How, also, though, um, the other thing that I, that I found very surprising and I was very happy uh, to know is that the Italian press has gone crazy with this book. The American press, less so, but, uh, but every ma it seems like almost every magazine and newspaper has written something about this, and they all say the exact same thing. They all say, oh, gee, we never realized we live with all this great typography around us every day. We never really appreciated it before. Maybe we should. So I'm hoping that maybe it will help preserve a little bit more, a little bit longer. Hopefully. I'm an optimist. Yes? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw this book, it's really nice. But when you confine this big typography in a smaller, like size, like a book, you don't think you lose a little bit of the power of the shop, of the of the work itself. And then, do you have any plans to like make larger prints? Because when I see them like this size, they would be beautiful, like in like people's houses. Like instead of to photograph big and go small. Yeah. Like big to be big. Big to be big. Yeah, I, I don't know if the resolution is good enough. Where are you, Spencer? Do you think it's good enough? <laughs> Probably not. Oh, you can't do photograph. No, I remember a lot of times asking Spencer, do you think we can make this a full page or do you think we can make this a double page? <laughs> but, yeah. I guess I'll just have to go back. <laughs> yeah, so you have a very hard life. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn it, I have to do another book. Rome, Paris. Yeah. It's, it's never a vacation. No. <laughs> it's true. And I cry whenever it rains. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. You said uh, in Luca there's no one who doesn't really. No, no, I, I guess what I meant is it's in, in Luca and Torino especially, it, it, it seems, I, I would always go around and ask, is there a law in this city that you have to maintain the signage? And they said no. But it, it, it was really, really incredible to see how, how many signs were preserved that didn't really have to be. Yes? To the dialect, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and the way and the way dialects are disappearing because of television and movies and everything. The same way the signs are becoming less interesting. That's a good point. Have, yeah. you, have you ever brought a sign home? Take it down. No, <laughs> that's an idea. I walked into a sign once and got a big headache, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. I should think about that. Yeah? Do you look so well in these? Apparently this one is. I, yeah. I, I actually have been getting emails from bookshops in Italy who said, how can we order your book? I mean, are they supposed to know that? <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, right. Hey. Uh, <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> the pencils are selling well there too, which is really surprising. Okay, time uh, for one, the one question, maybe the last one, maybe not depends on the willingness to ask more questions. Do you think is we should go in this city now and photograph something so that in thirty years we can make a book? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what do you think we should photograph? Because I mean, there's a lot of stuff that looks like shit now, but I'm sure. Like, oh, it looked great. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. No, when I started this book, I was only going to go up to you know 1950, and then I had to keep. I had to keep changing that because, yeah, I went up to I think like the late 60s, but. Yeah, but I think there are some nice signs in New York. 
It's, it's well, a bull frog. Yes, he's 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 the expert. Take a walking tour. Okay, well, that's a good last question, Mateo. We'll, we'll ponder on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.